you turn to Romans 11, please? Romans chapter 11. I want to begin reading at verse 25. And we'll read down through verse 29. I want to start at verse 25 again, though we have been, we've dealt with that verse already and, and verse 26 as well but it ties together what we need to read today and what we need to consider today. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Mark that, that's, he comes to turn away ungodliness. And then notice what he says in this verse. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Christ came as our Savior to take away our sins. He came to save us out of our sins. He came to die, to pay for our sins, to expiate them, to take them away. This deliverer came to Zion, as the prophecy that he's referring to here states, that the Redeemer comes to Zion, but here he says he goes forth out of Zion. I believe that means that the name of the Lord, this Redeemer who came to Zion, gave his life. Once he had empowered the church, that, that church, made up of mostly Jewish believers, went forth out of that place, taking the gospel to all the world. So this, the name of Jesus, when we send missionaries to the field, we send them to take Christ to the heathen, to take Christ to the world. So the Redeemer, literally the Deliverer, goes forth out of Zion, out of the church in the preaching of the gospel. Now in verse 28 he says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Now are they schizophrenic or something? No, he's talking about the Jewish people. He's talking about those that were blinded, that were enemies because of the gospel. And then those who there are, are the elect among them, the faithful remnant, they're beloved for the Father's sake. That is their Father's sake. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with whom this covenant was made, and who in a sense are the first fruits of it. But if we miss what is really set forth here, what Braxton was dealing with, in the Sunday school hour, it is in Christ Jesus, not in the fathers, that is Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's not in them that Gentiles are brought into this covenant. It is in Jesus Christ that we're brought into this covenant. And so when the natural branches, many of them who were blinded were cut off, there's a grafting in of the Gentiles and we are grafted into that covenant for Christ's sake. And that's what he is stating here. That's the meaning that we have here in verse 28. The father's sake, those fathers of the Jewish nation. How do we get in on this? It is Christ. Christ is truly the mediator of the covenant. He's the surety of the covenant. He is central to the covenant. And this is how we get in. This Abrahamic covenant, as we see in Galatians chapter 3, is called there by the Apostle Paul the gospel, which God himself preached to Abraham. It is the gospel. And that it sets forth the new covenant, that is the gospel covenant, 
it, um, it sets it forth, it expounds it like no other covenant in all the historic covenants, though all of them did in some measure set forth the new covenant, none like this Abrahamic covenant, because literally Christ is the seed of Abraham in whom this covenant is, uh, is made effectual. And notice in verse 29, this is the last verse we'll read for this morning, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. How do we know that this covenant is going to be effectual? How, we know, how do we know that covenant mercies are sure mercies? Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And they are eternal. Now let's, uh, I want to begin by saying that regardless of how things may appear, and I know we live in dark times. We live in a time when it seems like that so few are hearing the gospel effectually. It seems that many sit under the gospel, or some sit under the gospel, lost, and yet they're not responding to it. What is happening? Now, I know what many do in order to produce uh, results. Well, they'll bring in all kinds of Madison Avenue tactics and, and do all kinds of things to get people to walk aisles and say prayers and go into the baptistry. Is that really accomplishing anything? I think it's hindering. The gospel itself has to bring them. They have to come in response to the gospel. It has to be the Holy Spirit who makes the word of God effectual and they surrender to Jesus Christ, giving their heart and life to him. Not just accepting him as a fire escape, as a savior, but taking him as Lord and master and savior of your life, to live for him. And when we see so little result from the preaching of the gospel, other than that which is manufactured and we have a hard time believing it's of the Holy Spirit. We tend to think that maybe this plan of salvation, this salvation work of God is bogged down and it's been frustrated and we're not, uh, what's this all about? I would say let us never think that way. Let us never think that the word of God is all bogged down and this plan that God put into force is somehow stagnated and it's not going to work. Oh, maybe it worked in times past, not for this generation. That's what we hear. And I'm not saying that we are not to earnestly pray that there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I believe with all of my heart and soul there can be. If God so pleases and his people will earnestly seek him to once again pour out his spirit like he has in years past, he will do that again. He can. And we're to pray to that end. And as we'll see tonight in tonight's message, prayer in the heart that prayer that is in the heart is, is God's work itself. And oftentimes that will be a precursor. That will be what a forerunner to the actual answer to the prayer because he will make us, he will make us answers to our own prayers by taking this gospel forth. And I believe when we are earnest with God and earnest for the souls of men and long to see souls saved, it will put something in us that we will not only pray, but we will go and we'll witness this gospel. We'll not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But God's cause, this cause of salvation, his main work is not bogged down. It is coming to pass as he has foreordained it. We're seeing from this chapter the apostles' conception of God's unfailing plan to save all of Israel. That is the Israel of God, as they're called in Galatians 
There it's Gentiles and Jews together that make up the church and the apostle calls them the Israel of God. And that's the same Israel that all of them are going to be saved according to verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. It's this Israel of God, the church made up of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Now we are reassured that the chief and primary work that God is doing, that for which he sent his son into the world, it cannot fail. It is not frustrated. God can't fail. His purposes cannot fail. His promises are covenant promises. And you know, when God swears in covenant, it's not if you'll do your part, I'll do my part. He swears by himself because there's none other to, none greater to swear by. It's all within the Trinity itself, this covenant. And when God promises, it cannot fail. And that is why that we know that the, the cause of God, the cause of the salvation of souls is not coming to nothing. It is going forth as God has planned it. And again, I stress, that doesn't mean we're to sit back and say, well, God's working it out according to his will. I don't need to do anything. No, we need to pray. We need to work like never before. But the promise of God revealed in Scripture must be fulfilled. And so all Israel shall be saved. And so, he says. In other words, after all is said and done, this is the crux. All Israel shall be saved. Paul, what are you going to back that up with? As it is written. That's what he backs it up with. As it is written. And he's speaking of that which is written in Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, specifically. But what is said there in that passage and what he says here, we see that he is clearly speaking of the covenant as it is revealed in other places, not just in Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21. There he definitely declares that it's going to be the deliverer, the redeemer that comes to Zion and goes out of Zion. That is going to be the one absolute essential here is that Christ is going to have to come. And he has come. And he's done what he came here to do. He died. He rose again. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's exalted above all kings and of kings and Lord of lords. He reigns at the right hand of the Father. And he's overseeing the operation of the gospel. Has been ever since he arrived there. We're not in this by ourselves. We're not in this on our own. Christ is running it. I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. I'm going to be there all the way through. I'm going to send my spirit, and he's going to persuade. He's going to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Our Savior is reigning. He's overseeing the church. He's overseeing the ministry of the gospel. And we know that according to the promise of God, it can't fail. While we have tried to bring out the truth that is taught here in this chapter, and it's always important to get at the truth. It, there is nothing that is, uh, that we would consider an insignificant truth. Not in scripture. Truth is important. And learning what this passage is actually teaching is absolutely important. And whatever it takes to get to the bottom of it, that's what we need to do as much as we possibly can. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, teaching it as it is. But as we do this, we also try not to be abstract. 
not to just present this in a theoretical sense. These things must, they must become practical. This gospel is personal and it must become personal with you. So as much as we possibly can, we want to make it devotional. We want to make it evangelistic while at the same time, we don't need to make it. So it is that, but we need to see to it that we stress that as much as the doctrinal exactness. Knowing doctrine is not enough in itself. Doctrine is not enough, important as it is. There are many that know doctrine. They got it right up here. But it has not affected their life. It has not regenerated them. They still go on pretty much as they did before. Maybe they've made a profession of faith and they know the gospel inside and out, intellectually. But this gospel is a practical gospel. It is something that changes men. It's a holy making gospel as we've seen from this very passage. It's a humbling gospel as we've seen from this passage. But head knowledge must become heart knowledge if it's to be saving knowledge. It has to get from here to here. It is in fact in this way that the Holy Spirit, and I'm convinced of this, it's in this way the Holy Spirit identifies the true Israel of God, how he marks them out, how he sets them apart, brings them out from the rest. It is this very thing that the Holy Spirit has done in separating those that were blinded from those that were foreknown. And he still does the same. It's not a different God, not a different salvation, not a different Holy Spirit, not a different gospel. The same one that Paul preached. So he identifies, he marks out, he calls them out. Now if we would have proof that God's plan for saving his Israel cannot fail. We don't need to look any further than this passage right here, this chapter that we've been dealing with for several weeks now. How so? Paul himself. How did it start off? Had God, has God cast away his people? Has he cast away his people whom he foreknew? Paul's answer, God forbid. I am a Jew. I've been saved. Once he was a great enemy of Christ. He was a great enemy of the church. He was an enemy of this gospel. But he was also one of the foreknown. And by the grace of God, the Spirit of God called him out and saved him. He was a hard case. Do you know of any hard cases? You think God is able to save them? I'll tell you right now, if you can hold up Saul of Tarsus and realize what he was, who that man was and how he hated Christ and hated the church, hated the gospel, gave his life to destroying it, thought he was doing God's service, and then you see him now as he counts it a great privilege to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. His highest honor is that God saved him and made him a preacher of the gospel. And he gave himself to that work. And in Colossians we see there as he's talking about this very thing, this mystery, and how that uh, he was cho chosen of God to make this mystery known to the Gentiles, this gospel. And he's, he's rejoicing in the fact that he has suffered for the gospel, rejoicing in his sufferings. And my, how he suffered. But he had a gospel that had a hold of him and he loved that gospel and he loved to preach it and he loved God for calling him to preach. You know any hard cases? God can save them. Don't ever think he can't. 
The early church was made up largely of Jewish believers who were of that elect remnant. He makes it very clear in this chapter that there were those who were blinded and there were those who were cut off, but only in part. And by in part, he is talking about the measure of them. He's talking about not all were, only the blinded, only the obstinate, only the rebellious, and they remain so. But the elect remnant were saved. And many, as the gospel turned to the Gentiles, many of, of the Jewish unbelievers became jealous. And they wanted to emulate the Gentile believers and did. And Paul saw many of them saved. This was God's grand plan to save all Israel, Jew and Gentile. Now right here at Rome... Paul is writing this letter to Rome. He's never been there. He's going to go there. The last chapter of the book of Acts tells us when he arrived and what he did when he came there. And immediately there were those running around talking about this sect, the sect that had Paul so preoccupied. Wanted to hear about this sect. Paul said, okay, I'd love to tell you about it. And he met with them in his hired house as a prisoner. And the Jewish leaders came. These great men here in Rome. And he, all day long, he expounded the scriptures, expounded the law of Moses, and persuaded them concerning Jesus. Persuaded them that Jesus is truly the Christ. That he is the hope of Israel. And what was the result? At the end of the day, some of them believed. Right, right here at Rome. In other situations, when he was preaching to Gentiles, some of the great philosophers gathered at Mars Hill. The apostle preached the same gospel to them. And what was the result? Well, some mocked. Some procrastinated, said, we'll hear you again on this thing. But some believed. That's the way it always is. Some will believe. It's my prayer that in this congregation this morning, there are several here that are unsaved. What's going to be that you're going to leave that way? It's my prayer that some will believe. Now, clearly, Gentiles were being saved under Paul's ministry, while unbelieving Jews were thereby provoked to emulate them. Now, whatever may appear, and I come back to this point, whatever may appear to be the case, we may be sure that God's highest work, that for which he entered into covenant, with his son and with the Holy Spirit, the salvation of the Israel of God is being accomplished. It is just according to plan. The sure foundation upon which our salvation rests is the eternal covenant of grace. And believe me, that is what is set forth here in this chapter. And when he speaks of being in covenant with them, sending a deliverer to turn them from sin and to take away their sins, we're talking about the eternal covenant of grace, that which is the new covenant, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The eternal covenant of grace, it does not depend on us, it doesn't depend on others, but it depends on him to whom the apostle alludes in verse 16. This one who is the blessed first fruits himself, Jesus Christ. Because the first fruit is holy, there shall be a holy lump. Because he is the blessed root and all believers are attached to him. 
Therefore, his holiness is theirs too. His life flows into them. We know that from botany. We know that if we know anything about plants at all. That the life of the root goes into the branches. And we have that picture in John chapter 15 where Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. We get our life from him. And that is set forth here. That anal it's an analogy set forth here in this passage where he is the root and he is the first fruit. And all who come to him by faith, they are engrafted into this root along with Jews. And it's a great mystery as he deals with in Ephesians chapter 2 where Jews and Gentiles together, those that are near, those that were afar, he's broken down the middle wall of partition between them. And we all, whether Jew or Gentile, come to the Father by the same Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all brought into one body of the church. And this is the mystery that Paul explains in chapter 3. This mystery, which was hid of old in God, has been revealed to me for you, he says. And he says the same thing in Colossians chapter 1. It's been revealed to me for you. This wonderful mystery, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, this wonderful mystery that through the church is going to be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And through the church is going to be made known to the world. That this is the foundation upon which we stand. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on the power of God. Not on the ability of man or our fickle will. It depends, it depends upon God. In verse 23, he says, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. He's talking about Jews being grafted in. Gentiles are grafted in. They're grafted in together. And in verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. What is your hope? What is my hope? When I realize that every sin, if you think you've been eradicated from sin, you haven't. We still have that fifth column in us. We still have that old man that we have to battle every day. And I realize that every single sin has in it the germ of apostasy. What is going to get me to heaven? What's going to see me through? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Unto him, he's the one who keeps us from falling. He's the one who saves us. This thing is done by him, and he is in covenant with himself, and he's entered into covenant with us. It is sure. The mercies that we receive in Christ are sure mercies. They're called the sure mercies of David, our greater David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's able to do this? God is able. That's what he says here. God is able to graft you in. And he's able to keep you grafted in. And he's the one that will do that. With man, salvation is impossible. In every part, not a single part of it that we can do in and of ourselves. But God is able. He's able to save us. He's able to keep us saved. He's able to present us faultless before the throne when it's all said and done. What is our hope for the salvation of others? 
What is our hope for the salvation of them that seems so unlikely they'll ever be saved? Do you know any like that? You know, that's the way we think. We shouldn't allow ourselves to think that way, but we do. Oh, that person will never be saved. God is able. We need to keep praying. He saved Saul of Tarsus. God is able. He saved this sinner. God is able. He is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by Jesus Christ. So in spite of the natural condition of all sinners, and this includes all of the elect remnant as well, Paul declares by the Holy Ghost, and so all Israel shall be saved. Now he predicated this and based it on the fact of the promise of God that was revealed in Scripture. The promise of God revealed in Scripture. It is written. Referring to Isaiah 59, 20 and 21. A deliverer shall come, saith the Lord. Twice over, saith the Lord. This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. Still quoting, referencing Isaiah 59. So we have, we've seen concerning this deliverance of all Israel that first it involves the essential gospel mystery that I mentioned already, the mystery that he speaks of here. And it's not apart from the mystery of the gospel that this mystery is solved as he makes so perfectly clear in Colossians chapter 1, to whom God would make known what is the exceeding glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he's talking about his ministry to the Gentiles. Now, the, one of the great problems is Jews, they resented this greatly. Kind of like old Jonah, when the Lord commissioned him to go to Nineveh and and preach to that wicked city. Jonah went the other way. He ran off. He tried to get out from the presence of the Lord. Why? Was he scared of the Ninevites? No. No. He was afraid God was going to show him mercy. And he knew that wicked Gentile city deserved the wrath of God and he wanted to see him get it. So he didn't want to go there and preach because he said in chapter 4, I knew that you were a merciful God. I was afraid you were going to do this, and that's why I didn't want to come. That's after the Ninevites had repented of their sins. This kind of jealousy and racism, whatever you want to call it, it was prevalent. But this gospel is for Gentiles, and they resented it greatly. When Paul stood there and was telling them how the Lord had saved him and how he called him and put him in the ministry, everything was okay until he started saying, and he sent me to the Gentiles. And then they went into a rage and they wanted his life. You, a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, you, you're going to the Gentiles? You sided with them? That's kind of the way they were looking at it. This proceeds from the divine method as we've seen. Until or in order that the fullness of the Gentiles might come in. And when you read until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That is where many miss the correct understanding of this passage. That is not a time clause. That is a purpose clause. It is in order that the boldness of the Gentiles might come in. And that makes all the difference in the world as to how you understand this. The third thing that we've considered according to this method, all Israel shall be saved, 
for through Gentiles, though Gentiles are not of the natural seed of Abraham, they are his spiritual seed by faith in Jesus Christ. What does Paul say in Galatians 3? He says, if, anybody, if any man be in Christ, something to that order, then he is Abraham's seed, an heir according to the promise, according to the promise made to Abraham. If we believe in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed, that is, so far as this covenant is concerned, we are Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise that is made. And it's that very promise that we're, we're talking about. This deliverance accords with the ancient covenant promise. Now I've already said, and I've, I've mentioned Isaiah 59, 20, and 21, but I want you for the rest of the time that we have perhaps, go back to Isaiah, or rather Jeremiah chapter 31. We were here for a while last Sunday evening, but for a brief while, and there's some things here I want us to see. Salvation, this salvation lies in a person. It lies in a deliverer. It lies in a redeemer. Again, Isaiah says redeemer, and Paul says deliverer. Well, it, both are very personal. Both are very necessary. God does not deliver any that is not redeemed. And Christ's blood must be shed for our sins if we're to be delivered from our sins. If our sins are to be taken away. And if he's going to be our redeemer, he has to be our near kinsman. So he had to take human flesh. He had to become one with us. He didn't take the nature of angels. He took the seed of Abraham in order that he might through death destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil, that he might save us, that he might redeem us and deliver us from our sins. He had to take human flesh. And I think I mentioned this last week that this word deliver has the idea of being drawn to him. We must be drawn to him. The bride said, draw me, and we will run after thee. He draws us to himself. That comes back to what I was speaking of earlier. There is an attraction in Christ. The soul becomes attracted to Christ, and it's drawn by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. It's drawn to Christ. The Christ that it once rejected and had no time for, all of a sudden, that soul wants him, and it's drawn to Christ. Have you ever been drawn? Jesus said, they shall all be taught of God. All that the Father has given me shall come to me. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Well, how is this going to happen? They're all going to be taught of God. God is going to teach them. That is, the Holy Spirit is going to teach them, and they will be drawn. They'll be drawn to him. It's a supernatural work. It all has to do with the covenant and the persons of the covenant doing what they have agreed in covenant to do. Christ has shed his blood and purchased the people that God gave to him in the eternal covenant. And the Holy Spirit faithfully draws them, draws them to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Draw me, we will run after thee. I remember when the Lord was drawing my soul. Do you remember him drawing you to himself? Away from your old life of sin and to him? This is the work that he must do. This deliverance is from sin. Notice Isaiah says the Redeemer shall come to Zion. Paul says he will go out of Zion. And notice what he does. He turns away ungodliness from Jacob. 
that is from the remnant of Jacob, which includes Gentiles as well as Jews, and that can be proven from any number of texts. This deliverance is from sin. This is not just deliverance from hell. That's the way the gospel sometimes is presented. It's really not the gospel that's being presented. They just take a, take a sinner. Now, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? Well, who's going to say, I want to go to hell? Well, if you want to go to heaven, just say this prayer. Just invite Jesus into your heart. And they do that, being coached by the personal worker, they do that. Okay, you're saved. You're going to heaven. Nothing can change it. Do you really believe that? Can anybody really believe that? That you can kind of trick somebody into being saved? Or entice them that way? No, we are delivered from hell. And thank God we are. But it's not, the choice is not heaven or hell. The choice is sin or righteousness. Do you want to be delivered from your sins? Do you want Christ to be the Lord of your life? And notice this was God's covenant with them. Verse 27. Who are the them? Our salvation is a matter of covenant. It is a matter of covenant obligation and fulfillment. A covenant can be nothing more than just the sure promise of God. It takes no more than that. And that's why the Sometimes you'll have this referred to as the promise, and sometimes you'll have it referred to as the covenant. It's God's covenant promise. And to say the promise is sufficient. The Abrahamic covenant is a promise made to Abraham, which promises we see fulfilled in all of this that we've been looking at, the natural branches and the wild olive branches brought together into the same root, receiving life from the same Christ, and Christ being the first fruits of both, receiving the fatness of the olive tree. God had promised to make Abraham a father of many nations, promised to make him heir of the world. That's the promise. Now, if he had just come to be the Savior of Jews, that wouldn't have been fulfilling the promise. But God has kept his promise. He's kept his covenant. And Abraham is made a father of many nations. Now, since he's referring to the covenant promise that made there in Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, the covenant here spoken of, we may call the new covenant. This is the new covenant. Now I ask you to turn to, uh, to Jeremiah, and time is gone, but let me, let me make these points, and we'll be through for today, not that I want to hurry these, because some important stuff here. And remember that Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, are quoted by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 8 and quoted almost verbatim. And there it is clearly the new covenant, the gospel, the gospel covenant, and it is here too. Behold, verse 31, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Nothing was wrong with the covenant, as Paul makes clear in Hebrews. It was their problem. The, the covenant was wonderful. The promise was wonderful. They break it. Although I was an husband 
unto them, saith the Lord. I was faithful, they were not. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now, how is the new covenant? He said, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. And Hebrews said, if you, if you bring in the new, then that makes the other covenant old and done away. So I'm going to make a new covenant. How is it going to be different? Well, we know that when he made that covenant with them, when he took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt, that he gave them his law. But they break it. He said, now I'm going to put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This law is not going to be in tables of stone. This law is going to be written in the heart, in the inward parts. In other words, they're going to love it. I'm going to give, give them a new spirit, he said. And I'm going to take away that stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in them, he said. And they will walk in my judgments and keep my statutes. Why? Because we love them. I said last Sunday night, David could say, and he was an Old Testament saint, but he had the new covenant blessing because he could say with all of his heart, oh, how love I thy law. He loved it. Something had happened in him to cause him to love that law that he resisted before. Same thing happens to every believer. I'll put my law in their inward parts. I'll write them in their heart and they will be my people. I'll be their God. And then notice what he says in verse 34. And they shall teach no man, every man his neighbor, no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. You won't need that, do you know the Lord? Here, let me tell you about the Lord. You won't have to inquire. You won't have to say, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. From the baby in Christ who just now got in the faith, to the oldest and most mature saint, all of the believers will know the Lord. Jeremiah said, I will give them an heart to know me. And that's exactly what he does. Gives us a heart to know him and to love him. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Oh my. My sins. Oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sins not in part but the whole are nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord oh my soul. And God says that he will not remember my sins anymore that he buries my sins in the sea of his forgetfulness, and they will never be brought up against me. They are buried, and they are covered by the blood of Christ, and they can never rise up before God again. Does that mean that I'm sinless? No. It means that in this covenant, God has so worked through his Son, through this Redeemer and this Deliverer, that my Redeemer, my Deliverer, took my sins and he bore them. And he gives me his righteousness. That's my standing. And so when I stand before God, there will not be a single sin to be laid to my charge. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that can condemn? It is Christ that died. You know, that, that text, I love that text. There's your answer. But, 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 it's Christ that died. He paid the sin debt. Who can lay anything to my charge? Yeah, but I know, I know you. I've seen you. It's Christ that died. He paid for my sins. 
And by faith, I'm brought into this covenant. I'm brought into this promise, as Braxton showed us a while ago from Galatians 3. By faith in Christ, I'm brought into this promise. And it's mine. This is the new covenant. This is the gospel. It's a gospel covenant. And there is no rendition of the new covenant more complete, more full than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is that covenant. And if you will hear the gospel and if you'll trust in Christ, you'll be brought in to the blessings of this covenant. And God will bury your sins in the sea of his forgetfulness. And he will remember them against you no more. And if there's no sin to remember against you, there's certainly nothing to keep you out of heaven. There's nothing for which you could go to hell if your sins are all blotted out. They're all gone. In Christ, you have his righteousness given to you. It's yours by faith. Will you hear this good news and walk away from it unsaved? Or will you trust Christ, call upon him, believe on him, and you shall be saved?